It's a great message. I want to talk about the power of the tongue. And uh, I'm going to have... <laughs> but I really want to address it more from the angle of about ourselves than other people. Because we already know we shouldn't talk bad about other people. We, we probably have a good idea about that. And I think on the most, really try not to do that. But I think sometimes where we really miss it is about ourselves. The Bible is very implicit about liking who you are, loving who you are. Uh, Matthew 22 says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the entire being. And then it says, because it's a quote from Deuteronomy, and it says, And then love your neighbor, how? As yourself. As yourself. Now, we have no problem at times... Well, not always, but sometimes loving others. But some people really have a hard time loving themselves. And the only way that you can really effectively love other people is by loving who you are, liking who you are, realizing that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, as Psalms 139 says. If you don't have that ingrained in you, then you'll have a difficult time with other people. Loving them, getting along with them. Now, sometimes that's not all on us. Because you are a product, in a sense, of your environment. But how you know you can change your environment? So you hear all the time, well, I'm a product of my environment. Well, then change the environment. If it's a bad one, change it. If, if you were raised in a bad environment, then you've got to change your mindset. I would say probably the majority of us have come from some level of dysfunction in our family backgrounds and some at greater levels than others. And so thank God if you have more of a healthier family dynamic than maybe somebody beeping. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, sounds like going this way. it is? Yeah. Is it our alarm? Yeah. Oh no. Okay, let me let me click that, Tim. Hang on. Okay, I'm going to unlock it, buddy. Oh, you got it? Go ahead. You're the man. No, no, it was just like it shut off. It was like we were leaving. It was like we were leaving the premise. And either it's Bob or me. We have these little fobs in our pocket. And so once in a while, they accidentally get hit. And it says, all right, you're leaving the building. And we aren't really leaving the building. <laughs> So coming back to that, we're reeling it back in now, coming back to where we were at. It's that every family has a little bit of dysfunction. And thank God for families that have been raised in the church, that have deep roots in the church, and have healthy family structures. And hopefully you all know some of those family types. And uh, you've all probably heard my story many, many times, and, and that's this. My parents were both from heathen backgrounds, um, you know, any spirituality they had in their life was pretty nominal. My dad was Catholic. My mom was Episcopalian, but probably didn't really relate to the church that much. Um, in my mom's side of the family, there was a ton of dysfunction. Her mom died when she was six years of age. She's the oldest in her family. She raised pretty much her siblings and then they all went to boarding school. My thought is, in retrospect, although I've not known, but my siblings and I have dialogued about it in retrospect. You know, you pick up on things. As you grow older, as a kid, you're innocent. You don't know beans. But you just know something's not always right. Then as you grow older, you start putting pieces of the puzzle together. And we probably think my mom was probably abused. Um, probably sexually, maybe physically. And you don't know that until you start putting pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, my mom died at 47. I was, um, my, my cousin happened to be at the gravesite on Memorial Day. I, I, I posted, I, says, I didn't post, I just made a comment on my cousin's site. I says, I've not been to this place for a long, long time. In actuality, in retrospect, I don't think I've been back to my mom's gravesite since she was buried, in all honesty. Now, that's not because... I don't want to, it just the occasion has it afforded itself. And 
I already know my mom's not there. She's in heaven. I knew that when that happened. Um, the siblings in our dynamic, and our family dynamic, my older sister and I are a lot like our mother in terms of personality and temperament. Very driven, type A. That's kind of our personality type. You wouldn't know that because you never knew my mom, never met my mom, or et cetera. Um, Helen knew my mom, and uh, my mom really pulled some class things when we were first married that just as funny as all get out. And as a new mother, or new mother, as a new wife coming to that dynamic, let me give you a couple for instances. When we were first married, my parents came out to visit and I had got, I contracted poison oak, and I had it head to toe. I mean, I had open, weeping, running poison oak. That was horrible. And so I slept in another room. I think I slept on the couch, and Helen slept in her bedroom. She's shaking her head. What happened? Your parents slept in our room, and we slept in the other room with the twin beds. Oh, with the twin beds. And because I gave it to her. And my mother's, mother was just, why, why aren't you sleeping together? You know, she just bugged her that we weren't sleeping together. Well, Mom, we have poison oak, and it's really bad. It's the worst case. But this is the real corker. My wife, you know, every, how many of you, all you women, you have your way of doing things? You like the way your house is set up? You like the way stuff is put away? Because that's you. Well, my wife, in her linen closet, had our linens, our towels, everything put a certain way. My mom had the audacity to come into our house and rearrange all of that. Now, Helen never even told me that till after my mother had left. I would have lit into my mom, in all honesty. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have let that go. But she's just a good wife and a you know, lovely lady and chalked it up to my mom and being here rare and stuff like that. So it's just one of those family, family dynamics. Now, everybody has different dynamics in your family too. Um, for instance, we, my wife and I, have been away from our immediate families all of our adult lives. She left at 18, I left at 18, and pretty much we've been gone ever since. We, you know, pretty independent from that regards. Our kids, when they were raised, we didn't have any grandpas and grandmas and aunts and uncles around. Her mom was the closest at 500 miles. That's an eight-hour to nine-hour trip. So she would come down periodically. We would go there. But that's the closest. My family's 1,500 miles away, very rarely connected. But when we did, it was great. It was a fun time. So again, family dynamics are different. For us, it was a very good thing in the fact that it caused us to bond together we took seriously, leave, cleave, become one. And so I think with that, you don't hear, and with all of us, we've been raised in environments where even in healthy homes, sometimes the verbiage that we hear is not good. Even nicknames that are given are unhealthy nicknames. Stupid. Stupid was not allowed in our household. It was a swear word in our household. You couldn't say you're stupid. If John Mark or Matthew said, you're stupid or you're an idiot, or like that, all right, stop. Five good things about your brother that you have to say out loud. We did that. We enforced that because we wanted a dynamic in our household that was really positive. It didn't mean we were perfect, and it didn't mean Helen and I didn't get into it at times verbally. But in the midst of that, we never used language that was ultimately demeaning because that really is a character assault. And so I want to talk about the power of the tongue. I have three major scriptures, and they're very familiar. Proverbs 18, 21, Matthew 12, 34 and 35, and James 3, 1 and 2, and then 10 through 12. So what I want to talk about is not what we really say about others, but what we say about ourselves, because you may have had to extricate yourself from a bad environment where all you heard was the negative, and it's what is the voice in your head. Have you know voices still talk to even though they're not around? Parents, grandparents, they can speak volumes, and maybe that parent is even dead. The Bible says... 
though he be dead, yet he still speaketh. You ever heard of that scripture? In other words, that which they have spoken continues on. And unless we circumvent the negative self-talk in our head, we are subject to buy into the lie of the enemy and believe that what they may have said about us could be a teacher, could be an educator, could be an aunt, an uncle, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, whomever. And we believe what they said, when in reality we need to shake that off and believe what God said about us. Okay, so let's start at Proverbs 18, and I'm going to read verses 20 and 21, and I'll focus on verse 21. From the fruit of, the, of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. Okay, so it's really talking an analogous more about the verbiage than it is actual food. Now verse 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. What an astounding statement that Solomon makes. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Okay? So what's this talking about? If you'll look at the notes that I have on the screen behind me, I think I do. It makes this statement under point number one. It says, the power of life and death is in your mouth. The tongue possesses the power for life or death. He who builds strong bars with his tongue must suffer the guilt and loneliness that ensue, while he who sows well with his lips provide pleasant fruit for the soul. Okay? Our mouth will either distance people from us, or it will attract them to us. And... Also, beyond that, because I'm focusing in on this speaking to ourselves. In other words, it's impact into our lives. What you think and then what you say about yourself. Have you ever caught yourself saying something out loud about yourself? Oh, how stupid yeah. can you be? You ever said that verbally? Yeah. Yeah. Now, here's the thing about the enemy. The enemy cannot read your mind. He is not omniscient. Omniscient is a theological term which means God knows all. He's all-knowing. Only God is. The devil isn't. The devil's a created being, okay? And therefore, he cannot read your mind. But you know what he can do? He can hear what you say about yourself. And so when you speak negatively about who you are or your ability, you have now given him ammunition to use against you. So what he does, then he reads your words. Proverbs, or excuse me, Job 22, 28 says, decree a thing and it shall be established. That means put into effect, put into play, put into operation. What you say is absolutely huge. It's huge. So that's why what you think about yourself will manifest itself, we're going to see in a minute, out of your mouth. So you at times in circumstance, pressure, stress situations, anybody have any of those times ever? None of you, right? You, do you live in the same world I live in? Okay. I mean, the work demands, people demands, expectations, etc. All those things weigh in and they produce stress, which is literally then affects you physiologically. It triggers a juice in you. Is it like cortisol? And what ends up happening is it creates a, flight or a fight or flight mindset. Now, you can't live at a stress level which is always ready for a fight because it'll burn you out. You ever heard of somebody say, well, I'm burned out. Well, you shouldn't be burned out. Didn't Jesus say, cast all your care upon me because I care for you? So if you're being burned out and you're being stressed out, then what ends up happening is you're not operating in the principles of the kingdom. Now, we all have a stress level because it's just part of life in which we live. There are certain factors that happen. But if we're burning the candle at both ends and we're always stressed, something is not right because we're not operating in the principles of the kingdom. We've not created the proper boundaries and we've not learned how to say no to certain things and or people. So there are times we have to say no. It is in our best interest. Nobody's bugging anybody, poking anybody, right? None of you can relate to this, all right? So we all, we all have at, had at times had to create boundaries. Everybody say boundaries. 
healthy boundaries that are your in, in your best interest. You see, if you are stressed out, which ends up producing physical sickness and disease in people, then you're not of benefit to anybody, right? right. So what we need to do is we need to oper opt operate at an optimum level, and that always comes back to our thinking that then is manifest in what we say. So how I view myself and what I say about myself in circumstances and situations. Philippians 4.13, can anybody quote it for me? Absolutely. All things that are supposed to be doing, done. Okay, put it in perspective. I mean, there are some things you shouldn't be doing. You don't have the grace for it or the strength for it. So I want to take Scripture in its totality because there are some things that are not in your wheelhouse. You're not supposed to be doing those things. It'll wear you out. So it's understanding what's in my wheelhouse, what do I need to be doing, and then what I need to do is I need to be speaking life over myself, that I am created in the image of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what Psalms 139 says. I can do all things that are designed for me through Christ which strengtheneth me. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. So it comes back to this number one. The power of life and death is in your mouth. What you say, what you say, what you say. So if you need to go back and erase some of the past, or at least cancel the past, or cancel some of the verbiage that's been spoken about you by siblings, by parents, by grandparents, by aunts or uncles. In a sense, they, they think they're, they're helping you. They're not. They're hurting you. They've hurt you. You need to recognize that it's not of God. You need to forgive them if you need to forgive them, because sometimes that may come into play and understand maybe they didn't realize that they were doing the damage they were doing, because sometimes people say things, they don't even realize they're hurting you. And so that's why you have to rise above that, not be offended by that, because this is where offense comes in. The Bible, even Jesus himself said this, offenses will come. That means they're going to come. So it's my choice then to believe the offense or the word that's been spoken about me or rise above it knowing who I am in Christ and speak life over myself. Say that doesn't reflect who I am. There have been times I literally, somebody will say something and say, I just say, I don't receive that. Out loud, unapologetically, bold as a lion. No, I don't receive that. Now, I may not have done that when I was younger and had no knowledge and no revelation on that, but now that I have revelation, I just say, I don't take that. You can have that right back. I don't receive that. And be okay about it. So my point is this. I want to get all of us to begin thinking how God thinks about us and views us because that's what we will speak and we may have to jettison, get rid of past words or verbiage that's been spoken about us by parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, people in authority. People in authority have a lot of, a lot of clout in, in our lives. We've given a lot of clout to people in authority, and sometimes they don't wield it correctly. I really want to be an encourager. Now, let me just bring that around. At times, we may need to speak the truth in love. There are times that I've said to somebody, Hey, you know, that's really flaky behavior. Did you know that? That's not kingdom, that's not kingdom behavior. And you're better than that. And I expect you to rise up to the level that I believe about you and that God believes about you. So it's to, uh, just to hold them to a higher level and believe in them and speak that into them. If I'm going to speak the truth, because you can't let bad behavior just slide. At some point, it brings everything down. Sometimes you have to call people to the truth and say, let me help you. I love you. And because I love you, there are some things that maybe need to shift. Okay? And so it's affirming them at the same time. So number one, the power of life and death is in your mouth. Number two, the purposes of your heart are revealed in your mouth. Note this, the purposes of your heart are revealed by what comes out of your mouth. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12. Thirty-four and thirty-five. Now, this whole context is dealing with the accusation by the Pharisees and the Sadducees that what Jesus was doing was by Beelzebul or Beelzebub, which is the prince of demons. So it's in that context. 
just so you know the framework of what I'm talking about here. Jump down to verse 30. I'm going to pick it up at 33. It says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. This is the words are written in red in my Bible. Jesus is speaking this. He says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Look at that. A tree is recognized by its fruit. So if somebody says, I'm this, but the fruit of their life is this, something's not right. This fruit is not matching this pur pur purported tree. They're saying, I'm this tree. I'm a Christian. Bless God, I'm a believer. Okay, at some point, the lifestyle needs to begin to be reflecting that. How do you know there's a difference between a rank, brand new, born again Christian than there is somebody who is 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or there should be. Everybody say there should be. Okay. Why do I say that? Because the Bible is very clear. It says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. Isn't that true? So if you're truly born again, you're going to mature and grow. And some of the stuff that used to be in your life isn't going to be there anymore. So the tree is recognized by the fruit it is producing. What do people, and I say this, what do people outside of the church arena say about your life how do they view you after they've been with you for a period of time are you the same day in day out day in day out okay is there a consistency everybody say consistency see that's huge we were at lunch today the group of guys that i do construction work with we're sitting there eating, and the waitress comes, and she goes, you guys are, I shouldn't say you're gentlemen, and then one of the guys pops up, my boss, and my meaty boss, and he goes, oh, yeah, there is one. This guy right here, he's a man of the cloth. <laughs> See, so you, you don't, other people will, I mean, just live steady, consistent, all the time. And so people are watching. I'm just telling you, they're watching all the time. So know that a tree is recognized by its fruit. Now watch here. Watch this next statement. You brood of vipers. That's Jesus now calling them a real nice name. <laughs> Remember what I said? Speak the truth in love. Yeah. All right. How can you who are evil say anything good for the mouth? And here it is. This is the underliner. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is is full of so what's coming out of your mouth is really what's in your heart now he goes on and gives another illustration he says a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him some of your versions will have treasury and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him okay now look at my statement here i'm quoting matthew henry's commentary he says the heart is the treasury the words are the things brought out of that treasury. And from hence, men's characters may be drawn and may be judged of. That's old English for a sense of your treasure is going to come out and your character is revealed by what comes out of your mouth. Your character is revealed by what you're saying and what you're doing. This is why I've said often, Kenneth Hagin Sr. said, I could locate a person by being with them five minutes where they're at where their faith level is at because the fruit of their mouth was revealing what was in their heart. So that comes in every arena. So appreciated Daniel's teaching about the tithe. Now we understand for us here at Word and Spirit, everything that we have is the Lord's. Psalms 24.1, the earth is the Lord's and everything therein. It all belongs to him. Deuteronomy 8.18, as you spoke, Daniel, is absolutely true. It is the Lord who has given you the ability to get what? Wealth. Why? To establish his covenant among the nations. So either you believe that or you don't believe that. Now, wealth is relative in some countries because in some countries, $4 a day is the average wage. Nigeria, $2 a day is the average wage of the average Nigerian. 
Haiti, we will ask Roger when he comes in a couple of weeks, what's the average wage? Somebody was talking about on Sunday, it's one of the poor, it is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. I was invited by Roger and Margaret to go down there a few years ago. I went down there, preached their pastors. There's a group of pastors that are in there that they're responsible for their churches and then some others that joined us. Then I preached in, their, in a couple of their churches as well. But he's absolutely right. I mean, as you drive the streets of Haiti, you can see the poverty is everywhere around you. Now, here's my statement again. Are you wondering what I'm going to address that? The poverty that they are experiencing is because some people say, well, it's the government. That's part of it. It's true. Okay, that's in any environment. But bigger than that, in my perspective now, bigger than that, their problem is they serve the wrong God. They serve the wrong God. You cannot study the history of America and not follow the economics of America and realize we are a blessed nation in the short 200 plus years that we've been in existence. And whether anybody tells you or not, we really were founded on Christian principles upon the Judeo-Christian ethic. Read light and the glory just be, go back and read some of these books about the founding fathers and their beliefs yes some of them were deists i understand all of, not all of them were christians but there was still christian principles that were instilled in this country i was listening to clark howard in one of his little segments on the radio anybody know who clark howard is he's not a believer that i know of but basically the guy is he's he's a he's a He's a whiz. He's my age, Helen and my age. The guy is a multi, multi millionaire. But he's one of those guys that's just a penny pincher. Like he'll go to Goodwill and he'll buy a shirt for like two bucks and think he's got an awesome deal. More power to you, Clark. Good on you, mate. Not my style, but the guy is really very wealthy. He made a statement about our current economy. Here's what he said. He's in the know. He said, for every person looking for a job in America right now, in America right now, there are eight jobs available for every person that needs a job. There are eight jobs available. And his, per, his point was simply this, is that if anybody was going to make a shift to another job or a better job, this would be an opportune time because there are so many jobs in the market. The purposes of your heart are revealed in your mouth. You say, well, why do you keep going down that road? Because what do you believe about wealth? What do you believe about health? All those things are in your mouth. They're in your mouth. Now, I teach this. God's my source. This church isn't. The job isn't. Whatever ever else, God's my source. What does that mean? Here it is in a nutshell. Though I believe in a work ethic, I've worked all my life in all multi-myriad different things. The point is this. If you are, a, are willing to work, God will always see that resources are coming to you. And that it doesn't have to just come from your job. That God can get resources to you from whatever channel he wants to bring them. In favors, in blessing, in benefit, people that come up and give you money. Why? Because you've been faithful in giving tithes, offerings, and alms. And I just believe that. I've watched it. I've practiced it. And so what do you believe about money? Because it's in your mouth. If you believe that you're always going to be poor and you'll never have anything, then guess what? That's exactly what you're going to get. Because you believe for that and you'll attract that. Same thing with sickness and disease. What is your belief system about sickness and disease? Mine's this. It's of the devil. Yeah. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all. Everybody say all. all. Note this, that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Yes. Yes. Sickness is an oppression of the devil. Now, sometimes we've brought sickness on ourselves. Didn't I just say a moment ago, too much stress releases certain, certain, secretes certain stuff that is released into your system that is unhealthy for you and you get sick that way. Some sickness is just simply organic. It happens. It's there, flus, whatever. 
and you have a, a resistance that's been weakened and you're susceptible to that. Now, I thank God for doctors. I thank God for nurses. I praise the Lord for that. But you know, at the end of the day, Jesus is the healer. He is the healer. He's the great physician. So my belief about sickness is this. It's of the devil. It's an oppression of the devil. And my belief is God's a good God and he wants me to be well. So I'll contend for that. I'll believe for that. Do people get sick and die? Yeah. Do they? Yes. They do die. You know what? That's between them, God, and whoever. It's not my problem. All I know is I need to keep doing what Jesus said to do, laying hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I'm going to put my faith with their faith, and we're going to join together. And if they die, they have the ultimate healing, and that's they get to go see Jesus. But I know this. Sickness is an oppression of the devil, and God's a good God, and he's a healing God. So again, what's coming out of our mouths? The purposes of your heart are revealed in your mouth. And your heart is like a treasury. All right, number three. The perfection of one's life is spoken from your mouth. The perfection. How many of you know you can grow to be mature? Now, King James translates that word, unfortunately, because the, the Bible in the King James says, be perfect as I am perfect. One, some of the other versions have be holy. The word is tell you in the Greek. It means to be mature. means to be grown up. Okay? So I want you to go with me to James chapter 3. Hebrews, James. James, by the way, is the brother of Jesus. You all knew that, right? right. Jaime, or James, verse 1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. True. We give an account. How did I adhere to the word of God? Um. I could go down that road forever. I won't deal with that. I'm looking at verse 2. We all stumble. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. you. Look at your other neighbor and say, that's you. you. We all stumble in many ways. Ever stumbled? Walking along, not paying attention, just carrying on. All of a sudden, you trip, and and then you catch yourself, and hopefully you don't fall down, right? We all stumble. And What? Or hit a car, Yes. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. We all stumble in, note this, many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Or perfect man, depending on your version, yeah. That's a powerful statement. Able to keep their whole body in check. Why? Because of what comes out of their mouth. Jump down to verse 10. He gives a whole bunch of illustrations about that. Verse 2, verse 10 says this, Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Now, when I'm talking about cursing, I'm not talking you stubbed your toe and you said, Oh, because none of you have ever done that, right? Huh? That's not the cursing we're talking about. We're talking about cursing your fellow human being or cursing yourself. There's a difference here. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? Here's that analogy between trees again. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can can a salt spring produce fresh water. Okay, can't do it. They're two different things. And so what he's really saying there, and I'm going to quote now from the Believer's Study Bible, we're all prone to stumble in many areas, but if anyone can control his tongue so that he does not commit the various sins of speech, that person is truly well-rounded and well-disciplined. And we often talk about not speaking ill of other people, but I want to bring it back to home where we live because the key to not doing that is to really recognize in who you are, that you're not speaking ill of yourself. It is not self-cursing. It is not Dealing with yourself that you're not good enough, you're not, you don't measure up, you're not competent or any of those things. It's beginning to believe what the word of the Lord says about you. Now, I'm not saying the other is not there because that's also what it's talking about. If one can exercise control in speech, he should not have difficulty in practicing self-control in other areas of life as well. 
You ever notice somebody that's just their mouth is out of control? Usually their whole life is out of control. Let that sink in for a moment. Their mouth is out of control. Usually their whole life is out of control. Why? Because it's coming out of their heart. Women's study Bible, the tongue can be an instrument of evil or a conduit of blessing, depending on whether or not it is harnessed by the Spirit of God. So the perfection of one's life is spoken from your mouth. How I know, how you know, really, that you are growing and maturing and becoming tell you mature or perfect, as King James says, is by what is spoken out of your mouth. That's a key. Conclusion, the tongue is a powerful tool to speak life or death over ourselves and others. Let us use it to speak words of life over ourselves. And if we do, guess what? We're going to be more inclined to speak well over other people too. Because we'll love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We'll speak over our neighbor like we speak about ourselves. That makes sense? Yes. Cool. The power of the tongue. And you say, how did you arrive at that? Because two weeks ago I preached on the Pentecost. Remember Pentecost Sunday? Yes. And the power of the tongue? Last Wednesday I went back to Genesis Genesis 11, the, t the Tower of Babel, the confusion of the languages. And then today, I continued on. The tongue, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And I want to address it specifically about what you're saying to yourself. Let's stand.